Great. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the NLI USA Signature Speaker Series. I'm Adina Canefield, the CEO of NLI USA. This series is inspired by the library's work in collecting and preserving and interpreting the treasures of our people. Uh, the talk today, just a few days before Tisha B'Av, truly exemplifies the uh, creative ways that the library and NLI USA are committed to in making historical treasures relevant to today and making them come to life to enrich our lives. This series also provides an opportunity for NLI USA to come together with the library's experts and friends to share insights. You're going to have an opportunity as audience members via the chat function to engage uh, and post questions for our panelists that they will answer at the end of this discussion today. I now have the honor of introducing Professor Paula Fredrickson, our uh, moderator and commentator today. Paula studied the history of ancient Mediterranean religions at Wellesley College, Oxford University, and Princeton University. She is the Aurelio Professor of Scripture Emerita at Boston University and is a distinguished visiting professor of comparative religions at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which awarded her an honorary doctorate. In her 10 books and over 100 articles, she has investigated and reimagined the social and intellectual relations between pagans, Jews, and Christians in the Roman Empire. When Christians were Jews, her most recent book centers on first century Jerusalem and the role of the temple, both in Jewish history and in later Christian theologies. I am also proud to note that Paula is a former NLI USA board member, and she continues to be a great friend and uh, devoted to the library and to NLI USA. I know that you are going to enjoy hearing from Paula and from all of our speakers. Paula? Hey, thank you for that kind introduction, Adina, and welcome everybody to this conversation. I want to say first that I very happily and wholeheartedly served on NLI USA because of my commitment to the vision of the library, which is to have to be a creative center for Jewish cultures, variously globally, and also for Arab and Jewish cultures locally. And it works to expand the its impact on the cultural landscape of Israel and throughout the world. And the conversation we'll be having today is part of that project. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce um, our two speakers, Jonathan Price and Laurie Kaufman. Jonathan, um, your uh, academic uh, muscle mass is so big that I'm gonna have to read this rather than recite it. Um, Jonathan Price, Professor Jonathan Price is the Fred and Helen Lessing Professor of Ancient History at Tel Aviv University and the author of numerous books and articles on Greek and Roman history and also on the ways that historians, both ancient and modern, write about the past when they write about history. His work concentrates particularly on Jews in the Hellenistic and Roman periods and on ancient epigraphy, the study of writing on stone, that is to say, antiquities inscriptions. He has served as chair of both the history and of the classics departments at Tel Aviv, and he is an editor of Tzion, of the Oxford Classical Dictionary, and of the five volumes of the Corpus Inscriptionum Judaei Palestinae, a multilingual corpus of inscriptions from Alexander, minus fourth century, to Mohammed. So that's, that's quite a stretch. He is also the proud husband of Naomi Schachter, who helped produce today's event as the library's director of partnerships and international relations. So thank you, shout out for Naomi, and that's Jonathan. I'm also pleased and delighted actually to present my friend, Lori Banoff Kaufman, the author of Rebel Daughter, which is a novel about a young woman 
set during the period of the Jewish war against Rome and the temple's destruction. And Rebel Daughter has recently been published by Random House. Laurie, your pathway to writing historical fiction has been something of a long and winding road. Um, uh, Lori earned her bachelor's degree from Princeton University and then a master's of uh, MBA at the Harvard Business School. During graduate school, she and her husband Yardine wrote the Boston Ice Cream Lover's Guide. While this important addition to the Western literary canon never made it onto bestseller lists, I can tell you it definitely was a bestseller in Boston. <laughs> And uh, the authors had excellent uh, conditions for research because they got so much free ice cream while they were doing their research. Uh, in the intervening years, um, Lori has moved to Israel, raised a family, and worked as a strategy consultant for high-tech companies, where she helped military companies to commercialize their technology for civilian applications. Upon retiring from consulting, Lori went back to one of her first loves, which is writing. So we have two authors uh, who write about the past in different ways, um, but in similar ways also. And given the, the time we are on the Jewish calendar, uh, I was thinking about Tisha B'Av and how we, uh, the shadow of that event uh, still is, is strong. So many, uh, so many actually centuries almost to millennia later, but also under every chuppah uh, in the prayer book. I mean, this, this, is, this event was a hinge in Jewish history. And it's also, in a sense, for both your writings, um, it's the hinge of your respective stories. So I just wanted to invite you as we warm up to, to share with all of us how you think about Tisha B'Av when you do your respective work. Okay. So I guess I'll start. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question because it's hard to mourn something that you never knew. I never knew the temple. I certainly don't mourn animal sacrifices. And the other events that we commemorate, um, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain and all the other tragedies that were supposed to have happened on this day, it's hard, to, it's hard to connect to them on a personal level. Um, the late rabbi Jonathan Sachs said that history is what happens to other people and memory is your own story. And while it's not my personal story in many ways, I feel that it is the story of the Jewish people. It's seared in our collective memory. And like you said, Paula, we remember it when we say that Psalm 137, if I forget the over Jerusalem, we break the glass at the wedding, we remember it every year. So I do feel a little bit of a, um, I'd say the power of the day. And as I began writing the story, I did feel, I did feel connected to, to it emotionally because I think uh, fiction gives us a way to, to engage emotionally. And uh, seeing the events through one person's eyes made it more real to me. So I'd say long answer to your question, it's a work in progress for me. Yeah. Um, I have to say, seeing it through the, the eyes of the heroine you created uh, made that past very vivid for me too, as I read your, mm -hmm. your novel. Jonathan, how about the hinge of history as a, uh, a Greek and Roman historian of Jewish history in particular? I'll take a slightly different tack. Uh, first of all, I, I really identified with what, with what Laurie said. Um, it, is, it is a traumatic event, and I think that studying this event in great detail has helped me learn how to process trauma, uh, and also how to, I'm not saying that history repeats itself. In fact, I tell my students not to say that and not to think that. History never repeats itself exactly. However, there are patterns and there are things that in which we see ourselves reflected. Uh, particularly uh, this year, um, I'm feeling the, 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 the urgency uh, and the, the pressure of what I knew happened 2000 years ago, which was the awful murderous 
internal rivalries and factional warfare within the Jewish people who are all supposedly fighting for the same thing, but in fact, we're fighting each other just as fiercely as they were fighting the, the external enemy. Um, but I think that, that let's, uh, it, we can do a historical exercise. I, I, I like to, I mean, I'm picking up on what both of you have said. Um, it is, I think, our, um, our, our duty as historians to try to make the past as vivid as possible. And as Jews, uh, to make the past present. This is something that Jews do. So now I'm speaking not as a professional historian, but as, as someone who follows Jewish tradition, where we, um, we live through the Jewish calendar, the Hebrew calendar every year. And at each juncture, each portion juncture, it's not just that we remember things, but we, we are supposed to actually be there and live through them. The, the most obvious example is, of course, Pesach, where we say every year of Nagada, not that we remember what happened then, but what's happening to us now as if we are now experiencing the Exodus. Uh, this is the sixth of Av. We're now on the sixth of Av, three days before the traditional um, date of the destruction of the second temple. I say traditional because there's an historical problem there, which I'm happy to talk about afterwards. It's not what will delay us here. But let's say that in the ninth of Av, so we're three days before. In fact, if we really want to make the past present and live live the past moments, um, we can pretty well because we have, at least for the second temple, uh, a, a, uh, for the weeks come, um, uh, uh, going up to the, to the destruction, even the days going up to the destruction, we have a day by day, sometimes hour by hour account of what actually happened there by an eyewitness who is Josephus, Joseph uh, Yosef Ben who is a prominent character in Laura's novel. And if you'll allow me, I don't know if we have time, but if you allow me, I'm, I'll show you very, very briefly. Um, okay, just a minute, if I can share the screen. Uh, here we go. Okay, so you see, uh, do, do you see where I am? Yes. Okay, so this, this, is, this is first century Jerusalem. This won't, this won't take very long. This is first century Jerusalem. Uh, this is, it's bigger than, than the old city. And here's the, here's the Temple Mount where everything was happening on the 6th of Av. Um, the, the, what was happening on the 6th of Av was that uh, um, the, th this is, is the uh, model of, of the Temple Mount uh, of the city of Jerusalem in the first century at the Israel Museum. This, the Antonio Fortress was totally leveled and smoking. Okay, so just put yourself there 1,951 years ago. This was leveled and smoking. The, the, the Romans had ejected the Jews uh, um, uh, who had been using this as a stronghold to defend the Temple Mount, and they occupied it now. All, of, there was, there were, all around the Temple Mount were porticos built by Herod. These were, uh, except uh, on this uh, western, northern, eastern side, they were all either um, destroyed or burning. The Romans and the Jews both had burned these porticos in their fighting leading up to, and now, and this, you have to imagine, it's a huge area. Anyone who's been on the Temple Mount knows. And now all the fighting was concentrated here. So just imagine, you have to imagine not clean white marble, but, but smoke and noise and 24 hours fighting. And the Romans had built, had built three, uh, three uh, siege ramps here. They'd had the, the most advanced military technology in the world then, and they knew how to besiege. And they were, they were moving up their, their siege equipment and they had, they had ancient machine guns. They were firing darts and, 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 uh, and stones and missiles. And the Jews were up here fighting, uh, fighting, throwing down. They were fighting for their lives, uh, trying to, to, to destroy as many Roman soldiers as possible. They were screaming. There was, and also you can imagine the Jews were up here looking at the sky for a sign. There was no way in their in their in their idea in their mind that 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 God would have let left let God would let His temple be destroyed. So they were probably looking for a sign. Now is the time if it's going to come. We're almost done, and they were they were they had been not eaten for days. There was horrible famine. Uh, they were fighting, and the Romans were down here, well fed, fighting, attacking the wall, being attacked by the Jews, and as Josephus says amazed at how Jews on an empty stomach hadn't eaten for days could fight so tenaciously, fiercely, loudly, and ferociously. This is where we were on the 6th of Av, uh, 1,951 years ago. So there we were, and as um, this is how we, I think, experience history as in as much detail as we can. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to uh, take advantage of the visual orientation, Jonathan, you just gave us to 
think about stones from the past and ask uh, Lori, switching from hinges to stone, what, what gave you the idea to narrativize this as, um, as a novel? Mm -hmm. So when I learned about the, the, the stone that inspired the book um, from Jonathan, um, I was initially intrigued by the unusual love story, I have to admit, uh, more than the time period. I've always loved historical fiction, but for me that ended at World War II, <laughs> you know, maybe the Civil War. I'm not, uh, I, I wasn't uh, connected at all to the ancient period. But then as I started reading about the time period, I just became um, fascinated that there were so many parallels with our world today and suddenly it didn't feel so foreign to me. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the parallels were very troubling. The uh, religious fanaticism of the time, the aggressive nationalism, the civil discord that led to civil war, um, and the, the danger of these uh, ideologies and, and how fast they could spread. So all of that really just spoke to me, not only the personal story that was revealed in just a few Latin words chiseled on the stone, but also the story of the Jewish people. Um, so it was, it was both that, that really struck me. And I just knew that there was a story here. Um, I was especially intrigued by the, uh, the bigger story as well, once I got into it, because I couldn't understand how Judea, where the Jews were at the time, a small remote province on the Eastern edge of the Roman empire with no army would declare war on the greatest empire the world had ever known. Did they really think that they were gonna defeat legions of trained fierce soldiers? It just, it, it was just um, a question that I couldn't seem to answer. And so I, I kept, digging deeper and deeper. And, and of course, I mean, as you know, as soon as you start, you know, peeling away what, you know, you get the answer to one question, you have 10 more. So I'd say the narrative kind of uh, blossomed from two, from two angles, this personal love story. I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but it's, uh, you know, an incredible story is revealed on this gravestone of one woman who was taken captive when the temple fell and sold as a slave in Rome. And the owner who erected her gravestone um, obviously loved her. And that, and that story was just fascinating for me. And again, the story of this time, which um, maybe it was even more exciting to me because I didn't really know that much about it. And what I did know from you know Sunday school or from the you know, just the, the very basics that, that somebody would know today from, you know, from Sunday school and Hebrew school and, and what I've read, the little I knew it turned out to be wrong, <laughs> I think. Um, when, you looked, when I looked at it again through, you know, more of a historical lens. So um, I think the narrative came from, from a few different directions. And I always felt that I didn't really find this story. This story found me because it just was something that I thought, you know, there's just so much here. This is such a rich history, such an, uh, a history that's unknown to so many people, not to you and Jonathan, of course, but, uh, you know, most people, we're used to reading Jewish historical fiction that's about the Holocaust. We're not really used to reading many books that are set in this time period. So it was totally fascinating for me. Uh, thank you. Um, Jonathan, could you introduce us formally to the inscription, please, that, that Lori um, took with and ran uh, through the, the, her imagination? Sure, I'd love to. I just, I just put it on the screen. Uh, this is the inscription uh, that contains really a whole life story, much more information than meets the eye at first. It's a, it's a broken stone. It's found in southern Italy in Pozzuoli today, Putueli, which is in the Bay of Naples. It was a, it's a Latin uh, epitaph. And the inscription says um, as follows. The inscription is this. And, and uh, 
um, uh, there's actually more information than meets the eye here. It says Claudia Aster, uh, she's the one who's, whose epitaph this is, a uh, Hirosotumitana captiva, she's a Jerusalem captive. So you already know that we have uh, here um, somebody from Jerusalem. Claudia Aster was not her original name um, because she was I'm say a Jew captured in Jerusalem. Uh, this is a first century stone. And, um, and we deal with certainty and probability and the highest probability is that she was captured in the siege of Jerusalem uh, in 70. Uh, there are a few other times where she could have been captured, but you know, tens of thousands of Jews were captured during the siege of Jerusalem. And it is very likely that she was among those tens of thousands that was captured. Uh, then, we, then we see on the stone that Tiberius Claudius, um, who is a, himself a freed slave of, of probably uh, Claudius, put up the stone and he begs any passerby uh, to respect the stone in the grave and the person who's buried there and then she lived for 25 years. Now, uh, there's a lot more information that meets the eye. First of all, notice that uh, uh, Claudia and Claudius have similar names. Well, Claudia Astia was not her name. Uh, if, 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 when she was captured, she immediately became a slave. This is a fact, I'll tell you facts. She was a slave when she was captured, whether she was a priest's daughter as in Laurie's book or, or, a, uh, or a common laborer, she was, uh, she was enslaved and, and she was taken to the Roman camp. And as a slave, uh, she had a certain status uh, uh, in antiquity and she probably was passed through many hands until she arrived in the hands of, of Tiberius Claudius. Now he freed her. He freed her uh, because she has his name, Claudia, and a Latinization of her Hebrew name. Uh, think of Josephus. He was Yosef ben Mitityahu. He became Josephus, a Flavius. Just he got his 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 owner's name, Flavius, and a Latinization of his Hebrew name, Josephus. So Aster here, this Latin name, which actually means flower in Latin, uh, was was Esther. Here we have an Esther. Um, we know this from parallels on other stones. Uh, her, she was an Esther. It was actually kind of an unusual name in those uh, in the first century. Uh, we speculate uh, because of that that maybe she was born around Purim. That's total speculation. But on the stone, she was a slave. She was from Jerusalem. She was uh, she was probably passed with many hands. Cla Claudius Tiberius Claudius was the last one to own her, and he freed her. More than that, she died when she was twenty five, uh, probably in childbirth. It's not said. But there was, a, there was a law on the books since the time of Augustus, that is about 65 years before, uh, before um, the siege of Jerusalem, that forbade the manumission, the freeing, the liberation of slaves under the age of 30. There were various uh, reasons for this. Uh, Augustus thought there were too many slaves being released in, in, into society as freedmen, and he tried to control it, and there were many provisions but one of them was you cannot release a slave under 30. And there were, there were exceptions to that. But the only one that would have, could have applied to Esther would have been you can, you can free a slave under 30 in order to marry that slave. So it's pretty clear here, I think this, this is close to a fact, that Claudius, Tiberius Claudius bought Esther. Uh, he was her last owner because he freed her. Now, you know, owners don't put up epitaphs to their freed slaves. There is, has to be a special reason here. Also, there's no reason to, to, to free her, to marry her, if all he wanted was to use her as slaves were normally used for, for sex, for labor, for domestic duties, for anything he wanted. He could have had children with her as well. Uh, Romans had children with their concubines, but he obviously married, uh, freed her to marry her, to have legitimate children because he had special emotion for her. The fact of the stone shows a special uh, sense and feeling for this girl or woman. So it is, it, it, it is, it is, it is a pretty, it's speculation, but pretty historically probable speculation that we have here a love story. Um, there was, the, the, that's the probable, that's the most probable explanation for Tiberius buying her, freeing her, giving her his name and marrying her. Um, then again, I can go on forever, but I won't uh, again, but, but then as Laurie actually already, already mentioned, you can fill in the gaps. You know that this, that, that this stone that she started in Jerusalem Right. And by the way, if you put her in Jerusalem, you know what first you, a lot of what first first year Jerusalem was like. It, it was it was a medium sized city for those days, but small by our standards. She probably knew all the all the back alleys and, and buildings and markets 
and she probably choked on smoking the sacrifices when the wind blew the right day on heavy sacrifice days. And she was, and she knew the, the main character. She probably knew second generation Christians and saw them, maybe talked to them and so forth. She was in Jerusalem. She ended up in Italy. So she had to get from Jerusalem to Italy. She didn't fly or walk there. She walked obviously from Jerusalem to Caesarea to get on a boat. And Laurie describes that long march in very vivid and moving terms. We know what slave boats were like. So we put her on one of those slave boats. Uh, we know that Titus made several stops on the way to Italy, which he took slaves off the boats and killed them in amphitheater games. To Esther, Esther survived those selections. We know where she landed in Italy. Oh, she probably landed in Italy and she was either taken to Rome. Uh, she might have been uh, been portrayed in the triumph. You see on the right of Titus, that's total speculation, but she might have been taken to Southern Italy to be sold as a slave. We know what slave conditions were like. So if you just triangulate and fill in the gaps with historical knowledge, a little bit of imagination, you can construct not only a love story, which I think the stone gives factual evidence for, but a whole life in a period of history that changed the world. This is a period of history where Christians where Jews then became Christians, Paula, you know about that, uh, when Judaism was transformed entirely and fundamentally from a temple religion to a synagogue and, and Beit Midrash religion, uh, when the Roman regime uh, changed, uh, the, the, Julia, the first uh, family of emperors came to an end with Nero, and the second one was established. Uh, and this changed Roman history as well, including and especially the history of this part, of, I'm, I'm in Israel, this part of the world. Uh, so she not only lived an eventful life, she not only, uh, Tiberius left a lot of information about her, you just need a little bit of detective work to, to uncover, but she also lived in and through one of the most uh, uh, formative and exciting periods of history, mm -hmm. in any time, not, not just antiquity. She probably felt less than happy about that, given... Uh given the circumstances. I mean, most people, I mean, Laurie, I'm thinking about what you uh, said earlier and Jonathan also describing the ferocity of the defensive action. Uh, when um, the train had already left the station, the Romans were clearly going to win and yet um, the Jews were still fighting. It's more than just the Roman army that's around the city. The, the army was always followed by slave traders and um, there was a glut in the, in the slave uh, in the slave market. I hadn't realized this, but um, the pronoun for a slave can be an it as well as he or she. I mean, this is, this is a story about um, one of the consequences of ancient war being human trafficking. And, and um, the, her survival, uh, as, you, as you narrated, Jonathan, she had to get through many points to get to the point where she could die in Italy. That was already, it's already an amazing story of a of, of victory over un conditions we can. Um, That's true. I didn't talk about the grizzly stuff. Laurie has some, some, some of that some, in her novel. But, but there's no question, for example, that, that Esther, I mean, I think this is also pretty close to a, a fact. Esther was abused all along the way. Uh, she survived, but you know, she was taken captive. She was in the Roman camp. Oh, you have a voice for any girl or woman in the Roman camp at that time. And, and if she passed through several hands, she was abused each time. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty certain, I think. And, and Laurie actually put a very human, human center and, uh, and heart in those episodes in Hester's life, Hester's life. She certainly, I think this woman who's commemorated on this Latin tombstone that's now displayed in the Archaeological Museum of Naples, this is a woman who survived and suffered and and in the end, we think maybe I won't reel in, had a happier ending than the, than the middle of her life was. Well, it was certainly a story of hope because we know she did survive these atrocities, um, you know, this terrible war. And again, you know, I always had the two tracks, the, the Jewish story and, the, and this personal story. And you know, like like the Jewish people, uh, you know, it is a story of resilience in the end. And uh, there's a lot of messages that okay, you have to fight for what you believe in and human dignity and freedom. Love doesn't always come in the form that you expect, but also the sense that even when your world is completely shattered and destroyed, that there's still hope because we see that here's someone that clearly survived 
had to pass a journey that was horrendous. And, you know, there's, a, there's just an incredible story of human resilience here that, um, you know, even with all these sad, horrible things, I found very uplifting. And I wanted to tap into that part of the story too. Right. I have to tell both of you that it's wonderful to hear how both of you reflect what you can get out of this, out of only a few words uh, on stone. And it's, um, and in a way of it, the difference with memory and history that you opened with, Lori, this, your book combines both of those, mm -hmm. both of those mm -hmm. things. Well, I think you need, you know, you need imagination, both in history and in fiction. Obviously, there's so many gaps. I mean, you, you guys are the historians, but the forgotten voices of history, though, the women, the children, the slaves, we don't usually hear those voices. And, and the only way to, um, to recreate those, I think, at some level is, is to imagine them. Um, but I think that history, at least, you know, again, as I'm the one non-professional historian here, it, um, it approaches it usually more in an intellectual way. And I think that fiction can just engage us emotionally in the time. Um, you know, when you're, when I put myself into Esther's shoes, or, or I should say her sandals, and I, and I try to imagine, you know, walking through the alleys of Jerusalem and, and you know, rubbing my eyes from the smoke that, that Jonathan talked about from the sacrifices. And, and, you know, being in Jerusalem, I could actually walk on those very stones, you know, I could feel the heat of the, of the road, you know, through my own sandals. And, you know, it just puts you there viscerally in a way that um, I think reading a historical account of the revolt is just, you know, it's important to understand, I guess, the socioeconomic factors and the political factors and what was going on in, in Judean society at that point, the tensions between the aristocrats and the rural. But when you see history from the point of view of one person, it's it's like time travel for me, and I thought that was a that was a very uh, unique way to experience it and and make it just come alive in a way that I hadn't um, I hadn't thought about the events of this time period like that before. Well, you sir. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say, and um, I appreciate Jonathan your your continuous statement of, and this is almost a fact. Because we're dealing, you know, what a what is a fact, and, and what do we know? And that brings me to one of the characters in um, in your novel, and um, one of the bases for uh, Jonathan's research, which is the character of the guy everybody loves to hate, Josephus, as an as an eyewitness. How do you how do we think about? I mean, everybody who works in the history of this period is so grateful that he he did what he did at Yodfat and survived because we we just wouldn't have the information and the almost facts that we do if it weren't for him. But how do you how do you evaluate the story he left behind? Is he is he a hero? Is he a traitor? He was it. He, was, he thought of himself as a prophet, and and here here he is in two uh, two different visualizations. I must say, one very Orientalist, um, uh, and one not. What do you you both had to think about Josephus when you wrote your uh, when you write your work? What do you what do you think about Josephus, Jonathan? Um. Uh, okay, I put up image. These, these are this. Uh, this is not Josephus. <laughs> to say first of all, uh, uh, the one on the left is, um, as you said, Paula is an Orientalist view of a Jew. Uh, this was what uh, was made for the 18th century translation of Josephus into English. Wisden, which is still sold uh, and a bestseller today. Uh, and nothing to do with Josephus. And and on the one on the right is an actual first century Roman bust, which uh, with someone named Robert Eisler. Uh, who actually wrote uh, uh, Life of Jesus, uh, thought, uh, saw this profile. It was an unidentified bust and thought, oh, that looks Jewish. So he must be Josephus uh, because of the nose and the curly almost hair. Almost a fact, right. Uh, almost, almost, a, well, that's almost. pretty far from a fact, actually. Uh, 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 this is not Josephus. But anyway, 
uh, what do I think of Josephus? Um, whoops, uh, let me, let me un... Josephus, uh, as you said, we have to be uh, very grateful for. First of all, Josephus is, is in fact an historical character which has exercised the imagination of novelists um, and even um, uh, movie writers uh, for, for generations because he was an absolutely fascinating, troublesome, troubling, um, essential character from antiquity. Uh, he was, um, first of all, we should be very grateful to Josephus. Um, his, uh, the arc of his, of his life is rather troublesome. That is, he began on the Jewish side um, as, a, as a general. He was, he was in the first revolutionary government. He was a figure in the, in the last Jewish state before 1948 um, and had a very important position there, uh, was um, uh, the general and governor of the Galilee, uh, absorbed the first Roman attack during the war in the year 67, uh, was captured after a dramatic self-told story of, of people in a cave uh, who all committed suicide except for him and somebody else um, and survived. Um, he was in the Roman camp. Uh, he was uh, in the Roman camp. He became friends with uh, the Roman generals there, Vespasian and Titus, who eventually became the emperors. And then after the war, and he was a sort of a mouthpiece, not for them necessarily. I mean, he um, he obviously started on one side, very committed to the war, because he was he was uh, he was one of the leaders of the war, and then on another side, which was no, we shouldn't be doing this. And he apparently, while he was in uh, Jerusalem on Mount Scopus, or even closer to the walls, he was he saw everything was happening there, was getting information from people who were fleeing the city, and forming his own opinions, and also speaking to the Jews inside inside the, the city, according to him, having theological disquisitions with them on, you know, God, this is not what we thought God wanted this, we, we were wrong. Give yourselves up, and, no, get, save the temple, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll put this off for another day. Uh, after the war, he was taken back to Rome, given very uh, nice conditions, uh, a pad and a pension, and he spent the next 30 years of his life, probably in Rome, uh, devoting himself to writing Jewish history. And, with, uh, and, and it's because of him that we know so much, not only about this war, we can fill in the gaps of, of Esther's life. We can try, as Laurie has, has, has tried, to see uh, uh, first century events that he narrates from sort of from a historian's bird's eye view from the street of Jerusalem uh, to, the, to the entire span of Jewish history through the first century. And this, he's an essential source for early Christianity as well. And here's a man, who, who was a deep believer, who never stopped believing, who devoted his life to explaining and writing and recording uh, Jews and Jewish history for uh, multiple audiences. And the last thing he wrote was in fact, a brilliant work in which he defended Jews and Judaism against the anti-Semites of his day. You'd be surprised at how modern some of the like ancient blood libels and Jews were clubby and, uh, and hate humanity and so forth. Um, so here's a man who was devoted to Judaism. Uh, he was, he had a particular point of view. I think what you should do, everyone has a point of view. Every historian has a point of view. Josephus had a point of view. He changed his point of view, but it was very serious. And he was part of the, of the deep processing of the trauma that the Jewish people went through after the destruction. I think we should view him not only as a fairly reliable historian, sometimes incredibly reliable historian, with his own, own partisan views, and he distorted here and there. Everyone does. Um, but also we should view him in, in, in sort of a large view as, as, as a very important voice in the post-destruction, desperate conversation among the Jews. How did this happen? Why did this happen? What do we do now? And what do we do now is one of the main reasons why Josephus wrote his 30 volumes. He wrote 30 volumes. He spent, he must have, just think of 30, it was, it was, it was more than a volume a year. Uh, Paula, think of that. I mean, he, he, he was, he was better than, you know, more productive than we, than we are in our jobs. I mean, and he, he was, he was a phenomenal writer and, 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 a, and, and, a, and, and, a, and a, uh, a prodigious historian. But the most important thing about him is that he was a serious man, a serious Jew, a believing Jew who was pleading in the internal debate with his fellow Jews, um, not to disbelieve the prophecies that impelled them to war with the, Jew, with the Romans, that, that, that eventually, that this was now the time when God was going to intervene and, and, um, and, and uh, 
uh, topple the last empire in history, according to a prophecy in Daniel. I can talk about that if you'd like. Uh, and make us sovereign and bring the end of days and the Messiah. Josephus believed that at first, apparently, but then decided, no, we got the timing wrong. Not the belief, because it's going to happen. It's written in the, in, in, the, in, in the six scriptures. It's true. It will happen, but we were wrong about, about the timing. And if we want to save ourselves further trauma, we should just sit quietly and, and wait for this to happen without our direct intervention. That's basically why Josephus wrote history. And that's a pretty serious purpose. Why well, didn't we spend a lot of time, oh, excuse me, we spent a lot of time um, arguing about or discussing Josephus um, because, you know, the question just boils down to, was he a traitor? Did he betray the Jewish people? Or was, you know, his friendship with Vespasian and, and his, you know, going to the other side an act of statecraft? And, I love that he's such a complex character. As a novelist, you want characters where, you know, you can't, it's not out there. You have to figure it out. You have to dig deep. But what was for sure was that to the people of his time, to Esther, he was a traitor. I mean, they, they clearly felt betrayed. Um, the other uh, part of the Josephus uh, story that is so fascinating to me is, is actually, Paula, what you told me about afterwards is how we, have, how we still have his, his works today, that they were preserved by the church. And I think that's an interesting story as well. If uh, you could say a few words about that. What, because he's not only a very important figure in, in Jewish history, but in, but in Christian history as well. That's right. I, um, that's, that's a good point. It's, it's uh, two millennia of schadenfreude uh, in a way um, from, the, uh, from the other theological side. But I wanted to ask both of you, why, how is it that Josephus doesn't end up being a slave also? What, why does he end up with a, a lifetime stipend and access to a library um, uh, instead of having the same kind of um, experience that Esther Esther had. I mean, well, Josephus was a freed slave, like Esther. He was a slave when he was captured, and he was freed. Um, and Josephus was. This is the most fascinating thing about him, and, and some of the some of those fun conversations I had with Lori. Uh, because with Lori, I have to say that that I I did things that uh, that that professional historians think they should be embarrassed to do. Which mm -hmm. I, I came to believe we should not be embarrassed, but we should do it more. That is to to imagine. The interior of somebody to imagine what someone is actually feeling. Um, I, when I was in graduate school, we weren't supposed to think that at all. In fact, I don't know, Paula, we went to the same graduate school. We were taught, and this is in the 80s, in the classic department in ancient history, uh, that in fact, um, the ancient Romans didn't really feel loved as we did or as strongly and as passionately, and, and they didn't have feelings as we have. Um, their world was very different from ours in many ways. Uh, especially physically, and we mentioned slaves, a third of, 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 of ancient society was probably slaves, something that we in the Western world are not used to, at least now. Uh, but, they, but the whole thing, the whole uh, novel, the whole discussion between Laura and me, and I have to say, as I've, I think, grown as an historian, is to imagine people actually feeling things. And, 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 and we're very, we have very good authority on this, because the great ancient historian Thucydides says, Human nature basically is the same throughout the ages. They react to the same things the same, and they have the same feelings. And so, and so, so with Laurie imagining both Josephus and Esther was greatly illuminating for me as an historian. She uses the word imagination many times. So what was Josephus like as a person? Uh, in fact, he gives us, he, he's, he's, he wrote so much, we can almost, he almost incriminates himself. Um, he, was, um, uh, he was obviously uh, uh, skillful with words. He was obviously a manipulator. Uh, he obviously um, knew how to survive um, he, as well. And, he, and he, he, he knew sort of the right people to be with at the right time. I think one of the things that we uh, had to check ourselves was to, make, to be too cynical about him, to make him too uh, wicked a character, uh, to give him a, a sort of warm and human side as well, because he was. So how did he not become a slave? Well, he was a slave like Esther and freed like Esther and like Esther was lucky enough to land in the right place. Uh, I'm sure that from a lot of smooth talking, um, uh, uh, Josephus got his pension 
uh, and and digs. And he actually was put up in in, in the house that this, that the Roman emperors lived in before they moved to the palace and became emperors. So he has he has pretty pretty good conditions. Um, he wasn't actually required to write anything. You know, some people think, well, he was writing pro. He wasn't writing pro Roman history. Some things actually are very favorable in his books for the Romans, but. Uh, but uh, there are some things that are not so favorable. He was not writing court history. He was writing Jewish history as he saw it. And the Romans let him do that. And it was just a privilege he got for being, as he, as he thought, close friends with Titus, uh, the son of the emperor and then the emperor himself. He just, manip he, he landed well and he, and he manipulated the situation well to get the position where he was in the end. Um, Somebody on Olympic parallel bars, just you know, making a perfect, uh, a perfect landing. With that, Laurie, I got the sense from your novel that um, uh, Josephus wasn't the sort of person you'd want your daughter to date. Uh, <laughs> uh, is that is that accurate? I mean, do you did you have a complicated relationship with Josephus? I do. I do have a complicated relationship with Jesus, with Josephus, but. A part of me really admires the guy <laughs> because he wasn't afraid to admit that he was wrong. And, and, and there is the potential possibility that he realized that this was a crazy thing to do, which to me, it seemed suicidal almost from the beginning. I mean, again, as I said, as I said, one of the first things that was so shocking to me that why would, you know, the Jews with no army you know, even embark on this course. So for, for, for someone in that time to say, wait a minute, maybe God isn't on our side right now. I think that takes a lot of guts. And I have some respect for the, um, I'd say political sophistication and maneuvering that he was able to pull off. So I do admire him. Um, would an interesting question, would I want my daughter to date him? You know, it is, <laughs> it is a very interesting question. Um, but again, I was spared the dilemma because Esther, uh, Esther knew him in a different way. And it was very easy for me to put myself into the shoes of, um, of, of her rather than, you know, an object. I, I wasn't object. I didn't have to be objective. I could see her as someone who um, felt betrayed and you know the emotions of a young girl and the exhilaration and the confusion of young love together with you know the the presence of this older charismatic man that was that was the uh, the field that I had to go in I didn't have to um, actually be a the judge the historical judge I just had to look at him from Esther's point of view. And that was that was easier to do. But we I like that we're still debating him 2000 yeah, years later. We are, <laughs> and, and I think that the debates about Josephus are very reflective of debates about ourselves as well. You know, what, what we believe, uh, uh, how we apply belief uh, to, to action, uh, we take action. But let me just say also, this is not part of the, of the novel, but Josephus didn't always have it very easy in Rome. I mean, he himself, uh, had, I think, some pretty difficult moments as well. First of all, uh, there were constant, he's, he himself tells us that there were constant uh, accusations against him, people coming from actually uh, Judea, Palestine to Rome accusing him. Uh, now, there he, they weren't accusing him of betraying the Jewish people. That would, the Romans wouldn't have cared about that. They were, they were accusing him of undermining, secretly undermining the Romans in the background. He had to defend himself all the time against, against accusers, but also, Imagine certain moments, let me just mention too, where Josephus would have felt very uncomfortable as a Jew. First of all, he was in the imperial box apparently during the triumph, you know, when the Romans celebrated their, their triumph over the Jews. And, they put, and, and it was a three day uh, uh, parade and carnival and feast where they paraded through, the, uh, through the center, the heart of Rome, uh, all the spoils from the temple. Josephus was a priest. He served in the temple. He, would, they were, he was seen but passed before his eyes. Uh, Romans displaying as war booty the things that were most precious and dear to him. He was a priest. Uh, then they, then they, they, they marched thousands of Jewish captives. Esther might have been among them, we don't know, before his eyes. He probably knew people there. So, and, and, and what's really interesting is that, is that Josephus, who can be very emotional in his writing, 
describes the triumph from the imperial box in very impassive sort of uh, 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 clinical terms almost, not revealing emotion, which I think means that he felt very strongly, but he had no, he had no way to show it. Also, you know, after, after, the, after the, the destruction of the temple, the Romans imposed a Jewish tax. It's called the Fiscus Judaicus. And, and to collect the Jewish tax, there were some very uncomfortable moments in Rome, we learned from different sources, for example, um, uh, making old men strip to see if they were circumcised, to see if they were Jews. Josephus witnessed this, I'm sure, and, and, and probably had very little power to help uh, his countrymen in uncomfortable moments. So Josephus actually, I think, had not just an easy life in Rome and was constantly fighting emotion, arguing, um, uh, uh, justifying himself, defending himself, and trying to come to terms. I'm sure he had deep inner struggles as well um, with what happened and where he is and what he's doing. And his, of course, his part of his description, and this goes back to the comments Lori made uh, at the very beginning of our conversation, um, where I be, and you also, Jonathan, it's here are the Roman armies surrounding the city and inside the city, three factions are fighting with each other. And didn't somebody uh, actually burn down the food supply so that the others wouldn't benefit from it? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's very easy to meditate on the consequences of, of uh, internal strife and political fracturing, because that's, that's almost the saddest part of the story he tells. Well, this in fact is, is, it is the saddest and most tragic part. Uh, it, is, it is the part of the story that also uh, was so uh, prominent and important that the rabbinical sources in the Talmud, Mishnah and Talmud also uh, remark on the, the internal faction rivalry. And it's so intense, as you said, they actually during their turf battles, struggles, this was before the Romans even showed up, they burn the food supplies in, in the other uh, factions uh, uh, territory. And by the time the Romans arrived, all the food which had been stored up, the rabbis say for 20 years had been burned. Uh, this, what you mentioned, I mean, we can go on. In fact, the, the factional warfare is described not only by Josephus, but very well by Lori. Uh, and, and you just think, how could this, how could this be? Josephus also, I think, as an historian, uh, that was his main theme. If you read, if you read, the, if you read the book closely, his main interpretation, historians write about wars and they have interpretations of them. Josephus' interpretation of the war was that in fact, although there were grievances, although the Romans could be abusive, uh, although there were economic grievances and political grievances and, and, and the last Roman governor in Judea stage ruled pogroms, it was terrible. The real deep root cause of the war, so says our main historian was in fact Jewish factionalism. That's what brought on the war, continued the war to the very brutal, bitter end. That's his interpretation of the war. And I have to say, um, it's, it's a very persuasive and profound view of the war as well. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting is how that concept of, you know, it's translated the sinat chinam, the Hebrew term for senseless hatred, how many times in our current discourse we still hear that, you know, especially in Israel. It's always, um, you know, somewhere resonating in the in the public conversation, even today. You know, the road we don't want to go down. Well, yeah, um, Lori, I wanted to ask you um, in terms again of the combination of imagination and historical evidence, and the way that produces you know, both for it, it produces history and it produces fiction. Um, your main, we know how, how Esther's story ends. She dies at age 25. How are you gonna do a sequel to this book? <laughs> I don't know, we have, now I have to, I need a different co-writer, Paula. So uh, <laughs> now I think we need to tackle the early Christians, which is also an amazing story. I mean, to me, which was, was so interesting when we talk about the factionalism, I mean, you had the Essenes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and, um, you know, and the Christians who are all Jewish factions. And yet the only two that survived were the Pharisees and the Christians. And to me, the Pharisees who, who went on and, and um, 
developed rabbinic Judaism as we know it today. Um, maybe this is my business background speaking, but it's you know the greatest rebranding feat in the history of you know in the history of the world to take uh, Judaism after the temple is destroyed, where half of the, the the laws of Judaism relate to what went on in the temple, and to create from from the remnants of this um, you know religion that that had no place and no I mean it just it, did, it wouldn't work in this reconstructed world for them to have put together um, what Jonathan said before, uh, I, almost a, a different religion where instead of revolving around the temple, it's now revolving around uh, ritual and, and prayer and study in the synagogue and in the community. And to me, that was, that's just brilliant. And, and so that's, that is a story that I think probably is worth telling. And then how the early Christians became their great, um, turned into a great religion also from, from the remnants of this period. Um, Jonathan, isn't it true that most of the Jewish population lived outside of the land of Israel in this period? Uh, yes, there was a, there was a far-flung uh, uh, Jewish diaspora. Um, they didn't necessarily call it that, but the Jewish diaspora already 200 years before this. Um, extending from, from Europe, actually in Josephus's time, from Spain, uh, all through Europe and North Africa, all the way to Mesopotamia. Um, and we don't have numbers, uh, but uh, there were Jewish communities planted all over. Um, and in fact, uh, they were, from the beginning, uh, synagogue communities uh, who had their eyes on, on, on the temple, uh, but more in theory than in practice. There were pilgrimages every year while the temple stood. But what's interesting is that, is, that, is that these Jews who lived in communities, sometimes quite uh, well-established communities throughout the ancient world, um, were not excited or turned on or incited. You know, wasn't, this wasn't like the Spanish Civil War. It wasn't like they, they didn't flock to, to the Holy Land to defend the Temple of the Jews. This was really, interestingly enough, kind of a local affair. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a fierce and brutal local affair. Uh, and afterwards, most of the Jews in Judea actually moved to the Galilee, and, and, and for a while, no Jews lived in Jerusalem, uh, actually for, for quite a long time. Uh, but the, the, so the, the, the Jewish communities that lived throughout the world had certain similarities. Um, they had a kind of a synagogue-focused religion. They seemed to, they had the same Torah. They had the same laws. I mean, uh, throughout the world, uh, people noticed that Jews keep Sabbath and don't eat pig and so forth. This was said in, in Italy, as well as in Asia Minor, as well as in Egypt. So they had some commonality. They had, they had a shared story. Uh, you see uh, biblical images in their synagogues and so forth. But they were also very, very different because, because Jews tended to adopt the, cult, the language and the cultural, um, the cultural uh, uh, clothing of, of where they are. Uh, they often gave it a sort of a Jewish twist. But, but the, the, the Jews who lived, say, in, in, in Asia Minor and Sardis probably looked very much and spoke very much like the local residents of Sardis than more than they did, say, the Jews who lived in Babylonia, who more who looked like Babylonians and spoke Aramaic there and so forth. So, yes. So, I mean, my question is, in a sense, the diaspora for centuries had already gotten used to being Jews without having access to the so um, the, the, the trauma of the loss of the temple is preserved in Josephus. Lori, you speak of rabbinic Judaism. I was thinking of it as a PTSD sort of creative moment after that, that trauma, but it's a trauma that gets louder the longer Jewish tradition gets away from the actual historical period um, when, it, when it happened, except for Josephus, the only other contemporary writings we have with Josephus are the Gospels, uh, which ha are probably written after 70 because they have Jesus predicting that the temple will be destroyed. Um, and that's a historical rule of thumb, uh, usually on how you, um, how you date something. But there's, there was already what, what strikes me reading Josephus, and he embodies it, is a tremendous flexibility to Jewishness. And, um, and the, um, the, the locatedness of, the, of the, re, the religion in Jerusalem itself at the temple still being flexible enough 
so that there are people who are identifiably Jewish and doing the same things that some Jews are doing in, in Judea, um, dis, despite being widely dispersed. So um, there might have been th that condensation and that horrible partisan uh, violence inside the city. And yet throughout the both diasporas, there's, uh, there's a, the flexibility in the tradition so that it can continue to survive and thrive. And it, and it and make the and change the temple from a physical uh, space to a spiritual entity for the for for Jews. Yeah, let me let me point out that synagogue art in the centuries after the destruction is filled with images of the temple. So the temple the temple remained real or a dream or a vision in their hearts and prayers, if not actually a physical structure on land. Right, fun, fun fact, um, Constantine, the emperor who converts to Christianity, went to one branch of Christianity um, in the fourth century, had a nephew who became emperor, um, Julian, who uh, in the 360s decided he had had it up to here with Christianity. He's now a practicing pagan, and he decides he's going to, Jonathan, say it. <laughs> Restore the temple, build build the temple again. It's a, and in fact, there's even as the next time you come to Jerusalem, there's an inscription on the Western Wall written by somebody in Julian's time, uh, misquoting a psalm, indicating his 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 happiness, his thrill, his euphoria that the temple's going to be rebuilt. Of course, Paul, you can you can you can just, you can explain why it didn't happen. <laughs> we had the hand of heaven, obviously, but you didn't live long enough <laughs> that way. <laughs> Okay, there's the, there's the sequel right there. We've got it. <laughs> okay, so, all right, let's, I mean, do you guys have a formula for, I mean, where do you, I mean, at a certain point, imagination becomes intuition, right? Once you absorb the evidence that you have and, you're, and you familiarize yourself with it and you think about it, would you, to wrap up this conversation, would, do you wanna say anything about those relationships between how you intuit a personality, which is certainly, Lori, what you did with uh, Josephus, how you reimagine events historically that provide, I mean, war is not the background in either, for either of you as writers, that it's, it's the context for these mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. Well, I very much had to visualize the context first. I had to put myself there with a level of authenticity and detail that probably bordered on the obsessive because I really wanted to check everything that I could. I wanted to know what they were eating, how they prepared the food, what they what clothes they were wearing. I had to, to put myself there you know, in, like I said before, in Esther's shoes. But, but then as a writer, I think we have to accept that there's uh, universal human emotions um, that transcend time and place. And while I've never, you know, waited in dread for Roman soldiers to burst into my house, I have sat in a bomb shelter waiting for the Scud, muscle, the scud missile to fall. Um, to hear the boom. I, I haven't, uh, I didn't try to um, uh, call my little brother like Esther does in the this, in this story, but I did have three children who were with me in the shelter and, and I know what, that, what that's like. I, I've waited for the surgeon to come out of the, the operating room. So, you know, I know that excruciating feeling of powerlessness and, and fear. And, and so I could, I could talk about, I could draw from that. I know what, um, I vaguely remember first love and the exhilaration and the confusion. You know, you can draw on your universal human experiences. And I think that's why the, so many of the biblical, the biblical stories still resonate with us today because we do connect to the, uh, the, those human emotions. And so I don't know if it's intuition I don't know what you call it, but um, there is some kind of alchemy that that comes when you you can visualize another time and a place, and you put yourself in 
you know, in, in someone else's in place. And I mean, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, even really exciting research neuroscientists talk about neuro neurons that when we read about characters in fiction, we can feel the emotions that they're feeling. And, and I think there was a lot of truth to that because even in, in when Jonathan and I would discuss, well, what would it, what would it have felt like to be at these gladiator games and, and you know you're you're going to be picked next i mean it's it's very much um like the holocaust you know diaries that we read or you know some of the slave Amer african american slave narratives i mean you can you can draw on that um core of human emotion and i think there's a lot of a lot of truth to that that just doesn't shift even though the circumstances of the world are very different, right? And, and I would say, I would say that, that, that my experience in all of this was was just picking up what Laurie was talking about. Was I, uh, you know, I, I had before uh, Laurie and I, uh, before Laurie asked about an interesting inscription um, mm -hmm. randomly. Uh, I had written about uh, the events. I'd written about Josephus and about factionalism and about uh, movements and, and historical developments, and historiography and, and, and meta history and so forth. Um, but then, you know, uh, uh, I never really given much thought to how, in, in, to, to say what Laurie just said, how it actually felt, but I mean, actually centrally felt. You know, Laurie really, uh, for example, we, we, she would say, okay, the Romans have now entered the city and Esther's uh, cowering in her house. What did she hear? And I thought, well, I've never thought about that before, but obviously Esther, like many Jerusalem residents, uh, were in their houses and the Romans stormed through. What did they hear? They obviously heard something. So they, well, the Romans did this kind of boost. They, they, they heard these hobnail boosts. They, they heard horses, they heard shouts, they heard Latin, they heard Greek, uh, uh, they heard clashes. I, you, could, you know what it was like when, say, when, 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 a, when a stone hit a body or a shield or so forth, what did she smell? And, and asking these questions, okay, Esther was here in Rome or in Jerusalem or on the boat. What did she, and just imagine at every point of her life or the lives of the characters, what did they see? You know, they all, everyone we write about in history had eyes that saw and ears that heard and noses that smelled and bodies that felt. And, and it's a legitimate question to ask, what did they hear, feel, smell, at this particular moment? And she constantly was asking me this, okay, here's Esther now, or here is Esther's mother, what is she seeing? And this was these were these were incredible questions for me because uh, I never thought about it before, and they're absolutely legitimate questions. We as historians should think about these things much more, uh, not sort of a "you were there" kind of hokey thing, but really, what actually were they? How were they experiencing these great events? You know, the siege of Jerusalem, four Roman legions, sixty thousand soldiers, hunger, burning, fire. But what were they actually feeling at any particular moment? That really brought a new dimension to the to the books and the, the dry facts that I had been dealing with up until then. So to to uh, bring this to a close, because we are of course over time, what what I heard both of you say is that it's it's not only um, evidence and imagination, but it's also empathy. Yes. It's the empathy, empathy and curiosity. Mm -hmm. and yes. Exactly. Yes, Paula. That, that's a that's the way to put it. And that's the bridge between history and memory, maybe to defer to Rabbi Sack. Well, thank you both very much for this. I mean, I didn't think a tour of the destruction of the temple could <laughs> be such a positive experience, but this has been just absolutely wonderful. And I, I thank you both so thank much. You. And Adina, thank do you, you want to come back on? Uh, I just really want to thank you, Paula, Jonathan, Lori. It's been incredibly interesting. I think this, again, personifies um, what the library itself is all about. It's really bringing our treasures, bringing our history to life, to find the universal aspects of it, to connect with it, to learn, to extend uh, all those collections into our lives. And thank you for doing that, reminding us about what history is all about and bringing out uh, the, the best of the library um, and, and what, it, what it means to maintain the collective memory of the Jewish people. So thank mm -hmm. you very, very much. Um, thank you again all for joining. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.